Hi, today we've got an interesting model in the shop. This is a New Tone model 2057 2058, and this was the top of the line three wire tube base model in 1962. And this particular unit, this was made in October of 1962. And yesterday I had a customer come into the office and he actually brought me three of these. He lives in a neighborhood where every single house has one of these. This is an interesting model because it is the top of the line. It's a higher quality unit than the other models they made during the same time. This is going to be a multi-part video because sets like this, they require a lot of preparation before we start actually working on them. And so instead of making one really, really long, drawn out video about the whole thing, I'm going to do multiple parts just on his particular unit. This is the fellows who brought it into me because it'll take a little while. Brief overview on it. What we have here is it's an AM FM radio model with built in intercom. So down here we have the main on off volume control knob. And these, all of these knobs are in really bad shape. In fact, this one's kind of stripped out. So we'll have to deal with knob problems, along with all of the electronic problems that sets like this have. They have all of the sort of age-related problems like knobs and other things like that that come along, switches and things. Considering that if this was made in 1962, that makes this 55 years old, which is well beyond what I think anybody at Newtown would have ever imagined someone would still be using it. I'm sure that Newtown would have liked them to replace it at least three times by now, but they haven't. So we have a main on off volume control switch here. And then the outer knob is the tone control. Over here we have our AM and FM selector switch. And then here, we have our operation switch, so you could either have it on radio intercom or phonograph and intercom. And there's an auxiliary input down on the bottom of, of the faceplate where you can plug a phonograph into it, or you can run the cabling in the wall and conceal it if you wanted to. We have our AM tuning dial here, and our FM tuning dial here. On this particular one, this is rather difficult to turn, so that'll have to be looked at. We have our 10 room control switches, so you can have up to 10 remote speakers, and that would be a combination of inside remotes, door speaker remotes, and patio speaker remotes, which are really a lot like door speakers. So your three choices on your room control switches, in the bottom setting, it can be in both radio and intercom. The center setting is off, and the top setting is listen, which is like monitor or listen in on modern systems. Up here we have, it says volume, low, off, or high, and this is actually your master speaker volume. If you set it to high, the master station plays at the highest volume. If you set it to low, it plays at a lower volume. It's about a third less, I think, and off is off. Down here, your on-off volume control, this would be considered to be the system volume. This sets the maximum volume that any station in the house can play at, and you would set this to a comfortable level, having your room station volume controls turned up all the way. This always seems like an odd way to do this here, but that's the way they did it. I guess they didn't want to clutter it up with another knob or maybe they didn't have space to put that in there. So that's your master speaker volume control. And then you have your intercom control switch here, the little red slide switch. And basically it's listen or talk and it's a spring-loaded switch. On these early three-wire systems, if the radio is playing and you operate the intercom, you're speaking over the radio. It doesn't mute or fade out the radio. That's just the way it works. And since it's a three-wire system, it works like walkie-talkies. One person pushes and calls to someone, and then the other person pushes and answers back. So it takes two people to operate the intercom. These were available in several different finishes. This is sort of the um, silver finish. I think it needs to be washed and cleaned up because it's a, it looks like it's a little dirty. It'll be brighter silver when it's done. One of the other ones they brought in is the copper tone finish. They're nice sets. They're really big and they're really heavy. They're thick. They stick 
well off the wall. It's got to be about two and a half inches thick. So it's a pretty impressive and imposing type of unit. Here on the back side of the unit, you can see all of the tubes and other components. Up here, we have the terminal strip. On the other side of this are the room control switches. And this is where the three conductor cables from all of the remote speakers would be terminated. Over here, we have an oval speaker for the master station. This little adjustment right here is the intercom volume adjustment. And it says in the service manual that this was preset at the factory and shouldn't need to be changed. So we'll see if anyone's monkeyed around with that. You have your AM tuning condenser and FM tuning condenser. You have a primary transformer, audio transformer, your all important safety interlock plug assembly. Sets like this are powered by 110 volts house power. In the wall housing, there's a socket assembly that these pins plug into, and it supplies 110 volt power into the transformer, which then boosts and adjusts the voltages to drive the tubes and so forth. This type of design is common on tube radios. The idea is that if you open the set up, it automatically disconnects the power from the set so you don't get electrocuted. We have a bypass assembly to plug into this so we can work on this on the workbench, but you still have to know what to touch and what not to touch because tube voltages, they can hurt. And then we have a variety of tubes. This is an eight tube model. I think it's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is a higher number of count of tubes than the next model down, which only had five, I believe. And back in those days, the greater number of tubes, obviously it was better, and radios would have been sold that way as it's a seven tube model compared to a five tube model and so on and so on. It, it implies greater quality and those sort of things, which it is compared to the model below it. These little square cans here, here, these, these are all tuning coils for the radio. The way you really have to look at this, a set like this is, this is almost entirely radio. This doesn't have much to do with the intercom portion at all. In fact, this is a unique model because this is actually would be considered a hybrid model because it's not all tubes. It actually has one solid state part in it. And I'm gonna show you that now. So with a close-up view of the chassis, let's take a quick walk around the board and I'll show you the common parts and then what makes this a hybrid model. So if we start down here, this is tube number one, or what would be called V1 in the service manual. This is a 6BE6. This is the AM converter tube. And then we jump up over here, and this is V2. V stands for valve. Tubes are often referred to as valves. That's sort of an English thing but sometimes the nomenclature on circuit boards will be V1, V2, V is for valve. V2 is a 6BN4, and this is the FM RF amplifier. And then we jump over here to V3, and this is a 6BL8. This is the FM mixer and FM oscillator for the FM radio. Then we jump up here to V4, and this is a 6BA6. This is the AM FM intermediate frequency amplifier. And then I think we jump up here. We need five. Where is five? Five is right here. And this is a 6AU6. And this is an FM limiter. It's for the FM tuner. And then we have V6 over here. This is a 12AX7. This is an audio frequency amplifier. And then over here we have V7. And this is a 6CU5. This is the output tube for the amplifier section of the set. And over here, this is a 6V4. This is a rectifier tube. So this is output. This is changes the AC voltage into DC voltages that drive the rest of the board. Those are all pretty normal, small vacuum tubes that you find in almost any radio from the early 60s. What makes this a hybrid model? Well, what makes it a hybrid model is something that's right over here that's a little hard to see. So right here in this close-up, this little silver can right here, this is our friend that makes this a hybrid. This is a transistor, and this is a 2N233, and this is a really early germanium transistor. 
and its purpose is it's the intercom preamp. So when you use the intercom, the sounds of your voice go through the circuitry and this transistor amplifies up the signal and then it's fed into the preamp which is the 12AX7 and then it goes through more circuitry through the output through the output audio transformer and it comes out as sound. So this is a hybrid model because it's not all vacuum tubes. It's all vacuum tubes but it has one solid state part right here and that makes this kind of a special model. I don't know whether somebody was being clever and they decided to use an early transistor because transistors were still fairly a new thing in 1962 or maybe in 1960 when they started to design this set. It may have been because they wanted to use a more cutting edge component or it might have been because they just ran out of space and there wasn't a place for another tube and this and this and all the supporting components. So it's hard to know exactly because there isn't anyone to ask. Today's job is to remove all of the tubes from this chassis and test them all because I have to make a parts order for all of the components that I need to rebuild this set and I would prefer to order the tubes and all the other components all at one time so when they all come in I have what I need or at least what I think I'm going to need. Sometimes when you work on old tube sets like this there can be surprises. We're not even going to turn this on or anything like that until we do some checks and things on it because what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to just out of curiosity power it up and turn it on and have a lot of smoke come out of it and things burn up and fail and we cause a lot of problems for ourselves. This is really the type of project that you have to plan what you're going to be doing and you have to prepare for it and do a lot of tests and a lot of work on it before you ever turn it on for the very first time and that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the testing of one single tube and then if you're interested you can sit there and watch me do all the rest of them. So this is the this is the this is V8, this is the 6V4. It's also referred to as an EZ80. And you may be able to see, I hope, if I hold it up like this. This is an actual original Newtone tube. It actually says Newtone on the glass right here. And if we wipe away the dust, it's a little easier to see. This is the way I like to see sets like this because they're all kind of coated with a fine layer of dust inside and that tells me that it hasn't been disturbed. This says made for Newtone by Mullard. Mullard is a manufacturer of tubes. I don't know if they're still in business or not. Made in Great Britain. This is the rectifier tube. I chose this one to show you because odds are this one will be bad because usually they are. What you have to do is you have to look it up in the directory that comes with the tube tester, EZ80, and it tells you the settings to test the tube and it tells you what socket it goes in. It goes in socket number eight, which is this one right here. So we'll go ahead and put that in the socket and we'll set it up. So the settings are 6A7A, which is almost what they're set for. So perhaps that was the last time I tested one was one of those. And then you have to turn it on to see what the meter tells you. So we'll go ahead and we'll turn it on. And what you want to do is you want to watch the needle. And when you test tubes, you have to wait because they have to warm up. They don't conduct until they're warm. And the needle starts to move. And what we're looking for is we want it to be good. We want it to be good is 70% or better. And this one right now is sitting at about not quite 90 which is not bad. That's pretty good. Better than I would expect. So we'll leave it sit there for a few seconds as it warms up. And then you have to turn the knob, the function knob, to check different aspects of it. So the emissions are good. And now we do what's called grid leakage test, which so will turn the knob to the next setting. And the needle, the grid leakage is the bottom scale. So that shows as good. And then we have to do a short test to see if there's any shorts inside the tube. So what you do is you turn the knob to a short test and then you rotate knob number D to each of the positions. 
and you're looking for a constantly glowing neon lamp here. If it just flickers as you turn the knob, that's fine. It's only when it stays lit all the way that it's a problem. So we'll return it back to A, and we'll turn our function knob back to grid leakage, and back to emissions, and then off. Now you might think, oh, that tube's fine, but an EZ80 has two different setups that we have to check because there are two different sections inside the glass envelope. So our, new, our second set of settings are 6A7G, there, and now you have to test the tube again. So we'll do the emissions test. And fortunately, the emissions on the second test are good, about the same as the first one. Maybe even a little better. Uh, little blip there, that's okay. About 90%. 90% is real good. Now we'll do the grid leakage again. And that shows good. We don't really have to do the short test a second time because we already rotated the D knob through all of the settings and we know there were no shorts and we haven't changed the other three knobs so we know the short test is okay. So it actually turns out that this tube is still good. How is that for a pretty good value? This tube when it was new in 1962 probably cost less than a dollar and it's still good today. So that's what there is to testing tubes and of course they get a little hot when they're sitting there running. We'll take that out and we'll put that aside. When I'm done testing all the tubes, they'll all be wrapped up in bubble wrap and put away in a box for this customer set so they don't actually get broken. It's surprising how easy it is if one of these rolls off the workbench and hits the floor, it'll break for sure and then it's no good. So you gotta be really careful with customers' tubes. So now I'm gonna set up and I'm just gonna run through and test all the rest. So that's all of the excitement in testing tubes out of a new tone 2057-2058. As a summary, we have out of eight tubes, we have five that are bad. The EZ80 tested good at 80 to 90 percent. The 12AX7 tested good at 90 to 95 percent. And the 6BN4 tested good at 90 to 95 percent. All the rest of them the 5CU5 was bad, it had grid leakage. The 6AU6 was bad, it also had grid leakage. Uh, the 6BA6 was bad because it had a short on HK. The 6BE6 was bad, it had grid leakage. And the 6BL8 was bad because it had almost zero emissions. It was like 10%, so it was 90% bad, and that's not good. A little more than half of the tubes are bad, but that's not bad for a set that's as old as this is. It's also a good sign because it may mean that most of the problems with this customer's set are just age-related. It's bad tubes and other bad age-related components, and that's a good sign for rebuilding the set because odds are the rest of it will come together very nicely. So tomorrow I'll place an order for tubes and I have to make a list of other components that I need to special order for a repair like this. And then when those come in, we'll do part two and we'll talk a little bit about what it takes to work on a set like this, how to disassemble it and make it so it's easier to work on. So I hope you found this interesting. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube because that always helps. If you want to subscribe to our channel, there'll be a banner right here and it shows you how to click on the little bell on our YouTube homepage and you can subscribe and you'll get email notifications when we post new videos. So that's all for today. See you on the next video.